With the rise of GLP-1 drugs like Ozempic, Wagovi, and Majaro, we are witnessing a shift in how people eat. And according to Goldman Sachs, by 2030, it's expected that over 15 million Americans are on these weight loss drugs. And this is not good news for the food industry or for anyone who's in the business of selling calories. Because with these drugs, people are cutting out about a thousand calories per day. So just how is the food industry going to respond? And is this the end of the snack food industry as we know it? What we do know is that Ozempic is already impacting food sales. A Morgan Stanley report says that people on these weight loss drugs are on average cutting their food spending by about 9%, especially reducing the amount of snacks and sweets they buy. Walmart has also voiced their complaints publicly that they've noticed people on Ozempic are buying less items when they go shopping. Some economics reports are even blaming the sluggish and bad behavior of food stocks in 2023 last year on the launch of these weight loss drugs like Ozempic, although it's kind of hard to directly connect the two. It might be going a bit too far. Well, Ozempic may be a challenge to the food industry, I want to let you in on like a little secret. The food industry is incredibly adaptable. They're very used to jumping on a trend real quickly. I mean, think about the rise of like gluten-free products, gluten-free everything, or how popular vegan products are now. Food, the food industry does this every single year. Let me give you an example. What I love to do to see what's trending is go look at the yogurt case in your grocery store because yogurt hops on like every trend. It's crazy. I mean, first years ago it was fat-free yogurt. Now it's Greek yogurt. Now it's the flip cup yogurt. We have kids yogurt, adult yogurt. Like yogurt, I don't know why because yogurt's not that new, you know, not that trendy, but the yogurt category, they will hop on any trend possible. So while Ozempic may seem like a big threat to the food industry, I could also see it being the biggest area for innovation and therefore profits if the food companies are willing to tweak or change and innovate with this new set of consumers in mind. And if you're paying attention, we're actually seeing some slow transformations to take into account this new consumer base. And after doing some research, I've come up with three different categories that I think will just be ripe for innovation for food companies that are willing to change. Let's start with portion sizes because I think this is the most obvious category, right? Like people on these drugs, their appetite is suppressed. They don't eat as much as a normal American would. And honestly, this, this might be a good thing for America because we, we could try to go back to like portion sizes from like 30 years ago in the US, like these smaller portion sizes. And when I lived in the Netherlands, I always joke that like, if I got a large size of something in the Netherlands, it was the same size as an American like kid size version, right? Like a Dutch large size was equivalent to what we serve kids in the US. Like Americans were very used to different portion sizes than the rest of the world. What I would predict is that instead of like a frozen TV dinner, maybe we move to like TV cups or like frozen cups of food. And actually, I think the frozen food industry in general is positioned really nicely to adapt to this new consumer base, right? Like frozen food, it's already, you know, pre-proportioned, has a certain amount of calories, and can be high in vegetables and proteins, some really needed nutrients, especially if you're on GLP-1 drugs. Nestle, for their part, I think has actually already caught onto this trend. I saw they launched a new line of frozen meals called Vital Pursuit, and it's not labeled like for GLP-1 consumers, but I do think uh, that is the motivation behind it because it's, it's advertised as like 
for helping on your weight loss journey or your weight management journey, which makes sense, right? You don't want to advertise to like a very small amount of consumers. If you're more broad, you don't end up alienating any of your customers. But this new line called Vital Pursuit, you can see what it is, is really smaller portions or a lower amount of calories of very popular food items like frozen pizzas, uh, frozen TV dinners, and different sandwich melts. And this type of strategy, I think, can be used for any food or, you know, in any category. I would expect that we're going to see like bite-sized brownies or one bite indulgences. Instead of seeing, you know, individually uh, packaged chicken breast, maybe we see individually packaged just, you know, strips of chicken breast. But I would expect that these items, they're packaged with, you know, more than just one brownie in a bag, right? There's a bunch of bite-sized brownies all in one packaging because that way it's more flexible for like families or households because maybe mom and dad are using Ozempic and they only want one brownie but this way the kids can you know pop open the same bag and eat a kid-sized amount of brownies. Category two that I think is just ripe for innovation for the food industry is high protein and low calorie foods. And what I mean is these people, they will need to make sure that they're eating very nutrient dense foods, high in protein. They need to make sure to get their minerals, vitamins, fibers, all while eating a very small amount of food, right? Like this, this suppresses your appetite so much. You need to make sure the small amount of food you do eat will fulfill your nutritional needs. Because what can happen is as you're losing that fat, losing that weight, you also can end up losing a lot of your muscle mass, which most people don't want to do. And if you want to keep that muscle on, you better be sure to find some high protein foods that you enjoy. Danone, for example, which is like a very large food company, they have actually reported in the past year, they've seen this big spike in demand for their yogurt in the US. And if I had to take an educated guess, that's because the population on these GLP-1 drugs, yogurt is seen as a really easy way to get a lot amount, a high amount of protein while not consuming that many calories. It's sort of a healthy protein filled snack. I also noticed that Daily Harvest, which is a meal kit service, they have a new food collection aimed exactly at GLP-1 consumers or people on GLP-1 drugs. And basically this is a new line that's low in fat, low in calories, um, low in cholesterol, no added sugars, but high in protein and high in fiber. And soon enough, I'm pretty sure more and more food companies are going to catch on to this playbook of products that are high in protein, low in calories, and that these are growing because of these weight loss drugs and just how many people are using them. The last category that I think will lead to a lot of innovation and new food products for these GLP-1 users is one I didn't expect or foresee at all, but it's that some of the flavors of these products will have to be changed if you want to make them attractive to people on these weight loss drugs. Now, this is mostly based off of antidotal evidence or, or what people are saying because there hasn't been like a huge study done on this population, but users of these weight loss drugs, they've said they just don't have these same cravings they used to. They don't crave these salty snacks or this high sugary soda. They said, actually, that does not sound at all appealing anymore. Instead, they crave a lighter flavor or something that's a bit easier on the stomach, which makes sense because I've heard reports of some pretty bad gastrointestinal side effects while taking these drugs. And I mean, that makes sense. Of course, whenever you take any medication, there's a chance of having some pretty adverse side effects. But what I think food companies will do is take a product we already have, you know, something people are familiar with, and then tweak it just slightly so that it now is appealing to this new consumer base. Let's take a high protein beverage or like protein powder, you know, what I, I usually drink on days that I work out. Well, what flavors do I typically buy? It's usually chocolate, chocolate and peanut butter. I've had uh, cookies and cream, like these really intense in your face flavors. And what people on Ozempic are saying is like, 
No, 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 definitely not that. We want something lighter like a cucumber flavor that's a high protein drink or like a cucumber lime. It doesn't have to be this really like thick, viscous drink they're saying. Like give us something lighter, like just a clear, you know, high protein beverage, something that can sort of like quell nausea or at least not cause them more nausea than they're experiencing and really be easy on their GI tract to digest. Or let's take a company that makes potato chips. Well, you're gonna have to make a couple of changes. Probably first you need to reduce that saltiness, reduce the salt content. Maybe you start packaging them in smaller bags or like a smaller calorie size. You might also wanna incorporate uh, vegetables or more vegetables. You could advertise, you know, this is now higher in fiber, which could help with some of those GI issues. In essence, what I think we're gonna see food companies do for this new section of consumers is take something that's very familiar and just tweak it a little bit because most consumers, what they like is something they're familiar with. So by no means do I think this is the end of the food industry. If anything, I think this change in consumers' eating habits will actually open a big wide blank space for innovation and new products. If you enjoyed this video, next I would check out my video where I talk about how bird flu has made its way into cow's milk.